I think you've got to separate the, the mannerisms and the, the uh, uh, outbursts and so on and see, well, what exactly does he have? This is something that is, um, you know, it, it's worth pondering. I mean, when he decides he's going to withdraw from Syria or he wants to withdraw troops from, from Iraq and so on, in international relations, there's a, a strategy called offshore balancing. It means you no longer try to occupy uh, the territory that you, that's vital yourself, but rather you have regional coalitions uh, that do the job for you, and you keep your force in the background uh, in order to, uh, 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 to step in only if needed. That's essentially what, what US um, strategy in the Middle East was from the end of the Second World War until, until say, the invasion of Iraq. Uh, the invasion of Iraq saw the United States actually have a presence in the Middle East, the, the troops there, an entire garrison there. And what he's trying to do, in the Middle East at least, um, is uh, uh, have a network of uh, states that will maintain order uh, in the interests of the United States uh, without the U.S. having to be there. And this, this coalition would include Saudi Arabia, uh, Jordan, uh, Israel, and uh, the United Arab Emirates, which is referred to as Little Sparta. Uh, in uh, many of the uh, American internal uh, cables, uh, little, well, the, the writings. Um, domestically, it's hard to work out what he's doing. Um, it seems that every day or week, uh, at least in the first couple of years of his presidency, uh, there was uh, one fanciful claim, outrageous claim made after another. Uh, people would, would focus attention on him uh, and then he'd say something else, and people would then forget about what he'd said now, and he'd move on to the next thing. But in the background, I don't know if this is, a, if this is planned as a strategy or not, but in the background, uh, you've got uh, people like, or you had people like uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, uh, really putting in place extremely uh, hard class war type policies. Uh, you know, a tax holiday for the big corporations, uh, uh, cutting back on social security and other kinds of spendings, increasing the budget deficit in order to make it more, uh, more and more difficult uh, to spend money on, on, on society as a whole. Uh, and as, while people's attention was focused on Trump, in the background, the wrecking crew had gone to work. I don't know if that's a, co a conscious strategy or not, but it certainly is an outcome of what happened. Uh, in terms of bringing uh, things back, yes, he is, in fact, disrupting global value chains. Uh, the semiconductor industry uh, is trying to tell him, uh, semiconductor is uh, vital to the high-tech economy, uh, incidentally. They, um, you, know, you, you, you need them, really, in order to, uh, uh, to produce uh, the core of the modern you know, high-tech economy. Um, the semiconductor industry doesn't, is not happy uh, that uh, Trump has been putting all kinds of uh, tariffs and, and embargoes on China because it disrupts their supply chain. Uh, I believe that he does have a strategy uh, and is aware of the, of the problem he's causing to the semiconductor industry, but he wants to preserve American dominance uh, and isn't interested in the specific profits of a particular company, but in the overall power of the United States. Uh, let me explain what I mean by this. Um, the iPhone, the iPod, the iPad, uh, these are all assembled uh, in China uh, by approximately one million Chinese workers in factories that are run by a company called Foxconn, F-O-X-C-O-N-N, -N, Foxconn. Okay, so this is, this is from the time of the cable. So I'm going back to the, the time of the cable leak, uh, and I, all my numbers and figures are from that, that period, so you, I'm not taking things out of context. So one million Chinese workers assemble uh, iPads and iPods and so on uh, in these factories. But Foxconn is actually owned by a Taiwanese company called Honhai Precision Industry. Okay, Honhai Precision in, uh, Industry, in the year that the cables were leaked or released, made a profit of $3 billion from those Chinese workers in China assembling those iPads and iPods. In that same year, Apple in Cupertino, California, made a profit of $38 billion. That's almost 13 times the profit of Honhai Precision Industry, which, is, which, which owns the factories in China where these people are assembling 
things. So Apple's profits come from the branding, the intellectual property, uh, the marketing, and the design. That's why they're making almost 13 times the profits of Hon Hai Precision in the industry. So Apple is naturally concerned at the disruption to the United States supply chain, to its own supply chain. Okay? When Google is banned from providing updates to Chinese company Huawei and four or five other companies, um, when they're banned from, when, they, when there's laws and tariffs and, and, and outright embargoes on, on, on their ability to, to have these supply chains, yes, the semiconductor industry, the high-tech companies are upset by that, sure. But longer term, what I believe Trump wants to do is preserve American dominance. Uh, that even if individual companies have to take uh, a cut in their profits, if they've got to route around and find newer, uh, uh, newer uh, links in their global value chain, that's a price that he thinks they should be willing to pay in order to preserve American dominance. How, how important is the semiconductor industry uh, in the United States? Well, I think that the top, the top 14 or 15 companies by market capitalization in the world are either American or, there's two, two exceptions, I think there's Toshiba and uh, Sony, which are Japanese, and there's another one whose name I can't recall, but it's a French-Italian company headquarters in, headquartered in Geneva. Apart from that, the top 15 are all American in the semiconductor industry. Then you've got China coming in, and, the, and it's a very small company. This, uh, this is an attempt to maintain American primacy by enshrining the dominance of United States firms in the global semiconductor industry. Okay. Just as China has its own, uh, its own uh, strategy, like what China wants to do is get these advanced manufacturing companies to set up shop in China, which is like an assembly area for Chinese, uh, for their, for their, uh, for their um, uh, global value chains. But then it says, okay, after 10 years or five years of doing this, um, you can, you have, you're gonna have to give us some of the technology, share the technology in a joint venture with, with a Chinese company. Okay, so what China says is, we also want to climb the technological ladder and we should, there should be mutual benefit. It shouldn't be that we should only be a, a, a cheap assembly area for you, but after five to 10 years of this, we want to have some of this technology in a joint venture company so we can learn to make all this as well. Now, nobody's putting a gun to the heads of the CEO of Apple or anywhere else. It's their choice to, to get their profitability as, as high as possible by going to China. China doesn't think that that's espionage. Cyber espionage is a different matter. But China doesn't think that technology transfer is actually unfair trade. It thinks it's fair trade because just as it's getting some benefit, for, uh, just as the corporation is getting some benefit from getting its goods manufactured and assembled cheaply, China should also be able to climb the technological ladder, the ladder of technical complexity, in order to become a second world country or a first world country in due course. Uh, and that is what the United States is trying to prevent. That is the whole point of, of this technological Cold War. Uh, once again, I, I wish I could show you the data on which I'm basing this, this claim, and I probably will write an article to, to put it in there, but this is absolutely verifiable empirically. I'll tell you. Is a, is a follow-up question. I just wanted to go back to two other points. So I've explained the economic basis of, 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 of our foreign policy with our trade agreements, but one can't deny that there are two other possible explanations as well, and these all operate uh, you know, simultaneously. Uh, one explanation, which I think is not that helpful, but it is used a lot by, by the media, uh, is the background of individual politicians. So let's say people look at, try to explain how it's policy by uh, by looking at Howard's personality, the fact that he happened to be in, uh, in DC or New York uh, on the day that the September 11 attacks happened, and so he was heavily influenced by this. Uh, people look at Rudd's, try to explain Rudd's policy by, by looking at the fact he was a former diplomat who spoke Chinese. Um, and you see that kind of explanation in the press a lot. Uh, not in the business press, uh, which is far more rational and far more accurate, but in the, in the normal kind of uh, mainstream press, I think it's, you get that explanation. Uh, but I think you can go below that to the second level of explanation, uh, which is the level of identity. So although Rudd and Howard were two very different people, 
different backgrounds, they both would have seen, let's say, New Zealand as family, uh, Canada as our cousins, the United Kingdom and the United States as somehow broadly related to us. And you don't need to probe for a particular economic explanation to say, well, to predict what an Australian prime minister is going to do. The default assumption, the geostrategic reflex, is going to be, let's go along with whatever these guys are doing. Okay? That said, I think just the huge dominance of American investors in our stock exchange um, is a powerful explanation um, as well. Sorry. <laughs>